question. Yes. Uh, so things to remember from last time, basically the equation for the wave, which is box equal to mu nu. Yes. Okay, let's start again. So a couple of things to remember from last time. The basic equa wave equation, box h equal to mu nu, which uh, we set to zero yes, last time because we were concerned about propagation and detection. Now we will be studying production, so we have to restate the menu here. Other things to remember, okay, this definition of strain density, some tricks to, to uh, compute the strain, the strain density for periodic signals as well as for stochastics uh, and for stochastics also this notion of energy density the gravitational waves. And then, basically, the sensitivity of the barrel detector, ground-based detectors around 10 to minus 24 in uh, amplitude strain. LISA, a bit better at uh, lower frequencies. And then the pulsars, still 10 to minus 21 at much lower frequencies. And finally, the bound from the cosmological, from the cosmological microwave background, which is 10 to minus 16 in energy density. So now we start. Okay, now the new equation is box H equal to mu nu. That one is the general solution. And for sources which are at the bound support, uh, that is most of the, the sources we will be considering, we can, uh, since we are looking now, the purpose of this course is to give you some model of magnitudes, not to be very precise. We can just take the leading order approximation, which is uh, the quadruple formula, okay? This is the leading term, you do a multiple expansion of this object and you find the, the quadruple formula. And all we need to do is just consider various sources, compute the quadruple, and see how big it is uh, and uh, uh, what can be detected. What will we consider, the sources we will be considering here today are uh, spinning compact objects, supernovae, binary spirals, and then in the end, uh, something completely different, the regular cosmological origin for which we can't use a quadruple formula because the, the, the source is not localized, is, is everywhere. We will de deal with that uh, in, in due time. Uh, now I should start from the binary spiral emergers because historically they were the first to be detected and they are also most of the sources. But I'm afraid if I start with that, uh, I will never get that over, so we start from the spinning objects and from supernovae. So at least I know that I will, I will do that. Okay, so compact rotated sources, basically how they are uh, created. They are created from the, col from the collapse of stars at the final stage of evolution. And they spin fast because basically angular momentum conservation, like you know, the dancer, when the other contracts uh, in order to preserve angular momentum, it has to spin very fast. We already met uh, the millisecond pulsars as detectors, but of course uh, there can be pulsars or uh, rotating stars which rotate at a slower pace, like a second period of seconds or a few seconds. And of course there are objects which are, uh, we just simply don't see because the, the beam of a pulsar accidentally doesn't point to the Earth. What is the axis of it? It's hmm? The ah, the axis. Uh, it's, uh, ah, yeah. Okay, uh, these are the sensitivities of uh, the present detector, and this is ET. So you can compare it with, uh, with this figure uh, here. Okay, these curves, this blue curve is basically blue curve, the blue curve, the black curve in the other plot. Okay, or the, the blue curve. While well, the black curve is uh, ET. Okay. Yes, it's uh, the strain, uh, the strain amplitude in uh, Earth at minus one. Here is, uh, yes, here is, uh, uh, on the vertical axis is the strain, so you have about uh, 10 to minus 22, 24. Yeah, but these are upper limits, no? Because you don't know. Yes, these are upper bounds. And on the horizontal axis is the frequencies. So we have about uh, 100 hertz, here is 1 hertz, or 10 hertz, 1 hertz, etc. Okay? So the period of these pulsars have go from millisecond to a few second periods. Uh, how many pulsars can we expect to have? We, we, we see 2,500 pulsars in the galaxy so far. 
out of which a fraction of millisecond pulsars, that means that they rotate fast, which are also the most interesting because the faster they rotate, the faster is the, the derivative of the quadruple, you can imagine. And they are discovered at a steady pace uh, every year, so uh, there will be more. And of course, uh, as I mentioned, these are only of the to we see. And just because by sheer luck, the beam is hitting the Earth. If we don't consider this, this factor, we suppose that there are in the galaxy more or less 10 to the 5 pulsars, of which uh, you just do the ratio more or less 1 10 to uh, millisecond. And, well, in gravitational wave, you, you don't care if the beam is pointing to us or not. The gravitational wave emission is, is not isotropic, but it's really broad. It's not as focused as the electromagnetic emission. So if there is some object which rotates everywhere, even if it is not seen in the visible, we are going to see the gravitational wave. So as far as the rates, the, the number of objects, uh, interesting objects which are around, the number is more or less uh, 10 to the 5 in the galaxy. We are not considering extragalactic objects because, uh, as you will see, the, the signal given by these pulsars is barely seen, seeable by detectors here now in the galaxy. So if you just go in another galaxy, this is not going to be, to be interesting. Um, now, if you just consider the basic uh, modeling of the rotating neutral stars, it is not supposed to emit gravitational waves because uh, axisymmetric uh, distribution of mass which rotates uh, does not have a quadrupole. It has only a dipole and a magnetic magnetic dipole, but not a, not a quadrupole, so it's not emitting. Uh, but uh, it is widely believed that these objects with uh, neutral stars are slightly asymmetric, they are small imperfection because the crust is solid, so it can handle some, it can hold some, some axis symmetry. And so then, here comes the, 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 the little computation we, you can do it by yourself. Here, you just take compute the quadruple of an ellipsoid with two different inertia moments on the, on the two horizontal axes, and the object is rotating around the vertical axis. And there is a, a quadruple second derivative given by, of course, omega square and the difference of the two, uh, of the two uh, inertia moments. So if it is not symmetric, it can emit. And I can translate this uh, into this difference into an ellipticity. It's just the difference divided by, by some other quantity. And for the, this, upper, this, uh, this number, 10 to minus 6, is an absolute upper bound. It is uh, a neutral star cannot hold more than that. But in reality, nobody knows what is the actual number to be put there, could be 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 7. For sure, not more than 10 to the 6, so you have to, to consider these amplitudes as uh, upper bounds. So for a typical pulsar, a typical galactic distance at 10 kiloparsec, the adimensional uh, value of a gravitational wave is 10 to minus 25, and then we translate it uh, in strain, we just have to multiply by the square root of the observation type. So let's put one here, which is some more than 10 to the 7 seconds. And so basically, you get to this number for the strain 10 to minus 21 for an eccentricity of 10 to minus 6, as, which is an upper bound. This is, if you want, a theoretical upper bound. There are also experimental upper bound, which come from the fact that uh, uh, these pulsars are observed to, to slow down, to spin down, and the slowdown is basically built, given by the fact that it emits electromagnetic uh, radiation. There is this huge magnetic field which is uh, as a source of a beam, and you know, accelerated charges emit, uh, emit uh, electromagnetic waves, and so uh, more or less uh, as a balance, energy balance, uh, you say that the slowdown of the pulsars is given by the energy radiated in the uh, electromagnetic field. Now, you can assume, uh, if you have another upper bound, uh, that uh, more or less the same order of magnitude uh, in energy is emitted in gravitational wave, and so you can have also another upper bound for how much gravitational waves this object can, ob can obtain, can emit. Uh, so these are the, the, uh, the field, the empty dots here. These are the, the spin down limit. So, whatever these, these are all known pulsars, okay? And whatever they emit in gravitational waves must be below the circle. 
So you see, uh, for the slowing uh, 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 rotating pulsar, the millimeters are pretty much below the, what can be observed, which is expected because the gravitational weight is proportional to omega square. The black dots are the theoretical limit uh, taken with a more realistic value, 10 to minus 7, yet optimistic. And the, these dots are the coincidence, basically, the, of, the, of the empty and of the dot, meaning that for the, mil the fastest rotating pulsar, the eccentricity 10 to minus 7 is compatible with a, a spin down due to a zero of magnitude to gravitational wave emission. So this starts to be a reasonable upper bound. And you see that with a reasonable upper bound, we are on the limit of the detection. Okay. And that is, let me stress, for known pulsars. Pulsars that you have observed. And if you consider that for every pulsar observed, there are more or less uh, 100 unobserved ones, it might well be that uh, the observation of the first signal for the rotating uh, neutral stars is uh, beyond the corner. Beyond the corner. Okay. So this is a, a viable source. Not yet observed, but according to everything we know, pretty pretty close to, to, to being uh, possibly observed. That is uh, so far for uh, pulsars. Now let me move to supernovae. So there are two kinds of supernovae. Uh, one is, uh, I mean, they, they are associated to the same phenomenon. A bright thing is put in the sky, which is also recorded in history by the Chinese and in the 600, etc. But the, basically, the kind of supernova are two. One kind is when uh, you have a, a white dwarf, which is a creating material from a companion in the binary system. Uh, at some point, it accretes too much, and we know a binary dwarf cannot uh, sustain too much mass. And when this mass goes beyond this limit, which is the transversal limit, the other thing uh, is uh, the core collapse, where you have a giant star and, uh, you know, star they work. They burn uh, first uh, oxygen, uh, the hydrogen, then helium, and then they burn uh, by fusion to, to build them heavier and heavier material. They can do up it uh, to iron, which is the element which is uh, the highest concentration of energy per, per nucleons. And uh, Depending on the mass, uh, they start to burn the materials up to some elements. Not all of them are like iron. Uh, but at some point, when uh, you exhaust the combustible and there is nothing to burn, and you are not, the star is not big enough to have a pressure to start a new burning cycle, basically the star uh, uh, is uh, extinguished. There is no anything that have to burn. There is no any, any more the pressure to sustain the, the mass of the star, and the star collapses and collapses and rebounds and makes a supernova. Okay, and when we look at this, if you're lucky enough to see a supernova in the sky, we don't see the difference, but it took a lot of time to understand the two different objects. Uh, anyway, in the two kinds of supernovae, basically, the, the, the amplitude of, uh, of emitted, uh, of, of the mass gravitational emission is more or less the same. I uh, will come to that in a minute. Uh, what is the rate? How many supernovae can we expect to see, to observe uh, in this century? Uh, again, we are looking at the galaxy because uh, the amplitude here is such that uh, extragalactic objects uh, uh, are not, in, not detectable in gravitational waves. Of course, there are extragalactic supernovae which are routinely observed in telescopes, but not in gravitational waves. So, historically, uh, since we have records of supernovae since uh, before the Christian era, and more or less it is one of the three, every 300 years. But these are the visible ones, the ones that uh, people have seen in naked eye in the sky. Most of them, the majority of them, actually happening in the galaxy are mm, farther away or in the other part of the galaxy, for example, or in the disk, and so uh, the light is obscured by the disk and they are not uh, seen. So it is believed that uh, the actual array of supernovae, including the ones which are not seen by eye, but which, again, can produce a, a viable signal, signal of gravitational waves, is more or less 2 per century, which could go, could go up to 4, 5, 6 
in, a, in a optimistic model, but more or less two percent. And if you consider that the last one happened in 87, so more or less the rate is this one, the amplitude, uh, um, I mean, a, a supernova can emit uh, gravitational waves in, in various ways. Most of that because the explosion is clearly a, a non symmetric uh, phenomenon, so it generates quadruple. But if you want to have an order of magnitude, uh, you have, can consider the fact that, uh, strangely enough, uh, uh, if you have a rotating uh, distribution of matter which is also contracting, in this case, you have a quadruple. You know? Just rotating. No quadrupole, just contracting or expanding, no quadrupole, but if you combine it two, you have a quadrupole. So you put in some, some solar masses, making them rotate and contracting, uh, and uh, the, the order of magnitude you have for the amplitude of gravitational wave is 10 to minus 21. And the typical time scale here is the second or millisecond, that is the time it takes to a supernova to explode. And so we are talking about frequency of about uh, one kilohertz. Even the signal, uh, the amplitude, and uh, the typical frequency, we can construct our HS, that is 10 to minus 22, 10 to minus 23. It is basically this 10 to minus 21 divided by 1 kilohertz, more or less, which is a compound. And if you remember the graph that we saw about the LIGO sensitivity, it is 10 to minus 23, 80 even better, 10 to minus 24. So a galactic supernova is clearly, uh, could be clearly visible even in present thermometer, not to mention in the future. And so we just have to wait. 2% to the last one, 87. We might, <laughs> we might be lucky. OK, but this is certainly a signal that, uh, I mean, uh, the observation started in 2015. It should go up until 2040. It, it is uh, a reasonable assumption that a uh, supernova will be observed soon. OK, so now let me move finally. To move to to the to the binaries, okay? which is the largest class of signals which can be observed by by the parameters. Um, okay, the, this is a way for uh, I mean I don't want to get to the calculation, but uh, okay, you have these two masses, they rotate, and you can compute the quadrupole. The waveform is the typical shape that is an spiral, long spiral phase with an amplitude which is. Uh, you see, uh, increasing with time, and this is this uh, tau to my minus four here. Tau is the time to, to coalescence, okay? This is tau equals zero, and these are tau going up. So the amplitude is increasing. There is a factor which is basically the visibility factor given by the inclination angle of the ion pulsar with respect to us, which is not relevant for us at the moment. The MC is the combination of masses defined uh, here, here and above. It's just a typical combination of massive product and, uh, and sums of the two masses to some width power, which is what it is. It gives a typical mass scale uh, of a, uh, and time scale of a, of a process going, going on. And of course, there is the oscillating part uh, described as this uh, phase of the gravitational wave which can be computed, uh, it's a, a phase, it's a, it's a phase which is uh, not the same. Well, you see the frequency here is uh, low and it becomes larger, very larger. And you can compute this uh, as a rule of thumb. Why, why this frequency is, uh, is, is growing? Because the object is spiraling. The orbit was large and then you emit gravitational wave and the orbit shrinks. And, and becomes faster, and you can compute more or less at first order the behavior of the frequency just uh, doing the balance equation. Okay, the shrinking of the orbit in, in, uh, in one round uh, is given by the gravitational wave emission, and you have a, a, a equation, differential equation for the frequency, which is solved here, and so the frequency also grows as this one over tau. It formally diverges here, but, but because here we are using just a crude approximation. So it becomes infinity at some point. OK, this analytical formula are all refer to the spiral. At some point, uh, they cease to be, to be valid because uh, the objects are too close. Uh, this is another relativistic approximation. They go too fast. At some point, they merge. 
So basically, people truncate this expression at this uh, innermost stable circular orbit, uh, which a result of the magnitude is given by that. So for a two binary neutral star, it is, uh, this is 1.2 or 2 masses, so it is 1 over 4. For two binary neutral stars, the, the last uh, orbit frequency is more or less 1 kilohertz. For a supermassive black hole, it is 10 to minus something, uh, else you just have to put, uh, yeah, you put 10 to minus 6, uh, you go very low. Yes, for 10 to minus 6, it is uh, 10 to minus 3 Hz, or 10 to minus 9. For a super gigantic black hole, it is 10 to minus 6 Hz. Um, now, if you want to have the whole wave form, then you, com you combine this first part with numerical, and with target approximation for the ring down phase, which is where the final black hole is just settling down to the, to the, to the final state. But as a rule of thumb, we just want to study the, 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 the strain during the spiral phase, for instance. So we have everything which we want to do. We have the time dependence uh, here, the time dependence here, because the phase is basically the integral of, uh, of this frequency. We have to do the Fourier transform, which is not super easy because the function of time is complicated, but uh, it is done. If you have Majoris book, it is one of the exercises. And then you have a Fourier transform, and once you have a Fourier transform, you have to uh, multiply the square root of f, find a quality to obtain the strain, and the strain goes like that. Okay? There is a chirp mass, uh, one over l, and the, the behavior in frequencies is f to minus two third. Okay? So in, uh, in our diagrams, when we have a sensitivity, the it is basically this form, okay? It goes F to minus two thirds, this is the spiral phase, and at some point there is a plunge, and the signal stops, basically, okay? There can be some bump due to the collision, actual collision, but okay, more or less, this is what we expect, F to minus two thirds. But even scaling. Now, of course, if you're talking about into star, this happens in some regime of frequencies every, with some amplitude. The amplitude is given by the distance, of course, and by the total mass, the mass involved. And it stops at some frequency is also given by the total mass involved. The combination of masses here are different. This is the total mass, which is the chief mass, more or less. Okay. Yes. Yes. No, that's not a thing as well. The ring down is a collision, if you want. Yes, yes but in, the, in that picture... Ah, uh, uh, not visible. Okay. I don't know the, what shape it is in the ring down. The ring down would be after that. Yeah, it would be after, after that. And that bump is the merger phase, right? Yes. No, no, the detail of the bump depends on the spin. So if you don't have spin, the bump is very, very mild. But actually, there is no bump, it's just a flattening of the curve. The more spin you have, so the more you have uh, spin in the final object, the more the bump is pronounced. You can understand this qualitatively because um, the, um, the, the decay of the readout is lower for high spin. In principle, if the spin were max was maximal, you wouldn't have decay. Okay? The decay would be incredibly long. So as the, as the spin goes up, the, the readout um, decay is short. And time decay is longer, and so you have more and more cycles contributing to the ring down. And, if, and basically, the, the height of the bump at the end is uh, scaled as the square root of the number of cycles in the ring down. So this, this uh, bump is also an edge uh, that the fact that the, the black holes are spinning, they don't merge uh, directly, and don't give rise to any similarity, but rather they, rather they uh, really close to the ring. No, okay, that changed, that, yeah, that, 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 exactly, no? The more you sit in the final stages, the more the Fourier transform will receive contribution for additional cycles. Okay. So every additional cycle so you get contribution from, you know, the, the height of the, yeah. the, the Fourier transform scales the square root of the number of cycles. Yeah, so, yeah. So, uh, if the screens are uh, anti-aligned, so they, they collide fast, more faster, then you have less cycles at the end, and then you have the, the bump is actually, is really 
know there. So, so that the standard stuff for, for the, you know, the features of the dynamics are directly printed in, in the spec. Okay. And so, yeah, as I was saying, this is the shape, more or less. Okay, let's, let's forget this. And where is this situated? How high it is and where is the end point? It depends on the object involved, and so it depends on where you can observe them in Virgo, in Lisa, in the Pulsar days, etc. Et and so far, there is basically one class of object which has been detected that is the compact binary latest parallels and merger, okay? The merger phase of objects which are very compact, like black holes, in the style, which are very, very close. So we're thinking about more or less strains of 10 to 122, so well above the detection threshold, indeed they've been detected, a frequency from 10 to 100 hertz up to a few, a few, a few hundreds. These are the ones that have been uh, detected so far. It is basically either solar masses of mm, masses from 10 to up to 100 solar masses, or a few neutral stars, couple of solar masses. Okay, and they are really in the real final phase. You observe the last minutes or seconds of a spiral. In a string case, the first detection was five cycles because it was a huge black hole, and uh, and they saw the, the end point of the, of the the plunge was very close to the, to the beginning of the sensitivity curve of LIGO, so you could really see the, the last part. For my neutral stars, you can see thousands of cycles, and this is the object. So, uh, how many objects do we have? Um, well, but there have been, the observation says uh, 100, more or less, observations in a few years. Of course, given the sensitivity, it is believed that, uh, and I'm not talking about the galaxy now, these are extragalactic objects because, as uh, you will see, the, the galaxy rate is low, and I uh, thanks God because uh, I think, I don't know if we will survive to a, to a merge, merge close to us. It's, very, it's much more violent than supernova, but I don't know. What? A merger, the radiation of a merger would uh, possibly kill us? Come on. No? Uh, Galactic, no. Electromagnetic radiation for the galaxy merger. Ah, yeah, I mean, if, if it, uh, you mean the gamma ray? Yeah. If it's pointing to Earth, that, that might, could be might, bad, be, yeah. might be... That could be bad. But don't worry, because uh, it is believed that the total rate in the universe of mergers is more or less 10 to 1. Five mergers per year in the whole universe. Since the universe, there are 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12 galaxies, the rate in the galaxies is pretty low. Okay. So everything is observed beyond the galaxies. So 10 observations, I mean a few tens of observations per year in LIGO, in ET, basically all of them will be seen. The reach of ET is uh, larger than the reach of, uh, of LIGO and we basically cover the whole universe. You don't need to go that far, you need to go just to an epoch where stuff did not exist anymore. Once you are there, you have seen everything, unless uh, exotic s stuff. But uh, if you arrive at the horizon where uh, the beginning of start uh, is, uh, this is what you have to see. So, it, more or less, uh, all the black hole black hole collision in the universe will be seen by ET, so 10 to the 5 meters per year. Slightly less uh, for uh, BNS, uh, because the signal is slightly lower. Uh, so, but still, a sensible fraction of the BNS uh, binary to star collision will be seen uh, by ET. But as I mentioned, this is only one class of signals in, in within this uh, one subclass within this class uh, of uh, mergers. The ring down phase has not yet been observed for these objects, and I, we are speaking. These are the typical. Uh, the typical uh, strain and frequency, so it could be observable. It is probably observable in the next, uh, either in the next rounds or in the, in the future, in, in ET, probably, in uh, the new generation of uh, detectors. Then there are the not so compact binary spirals. So, so I'm speaking about neutral stars, black holes, which are not in the very last minutes of our life, but yet they are just a few here or hundred years before uh, the collision, so they are further apart. They are just spiraling, 
so the, uh, but they still emit gravitational waves. In this case, we have to go much lower in the frequency, in the frequency range, because they are still far apart. So it is 10 to minus 2, and I pointed out this 10 to minus 2 because it is uh, the lesser frequency band, okay? I could have chosen this uh, the object, uh, also 10 to minus 1 and, and 0 Hz, but uh, the one which are uh, interesting uh, experimentally are 10 to minus 2. And in that case, again, not with restraint is uh, 10 to minus 18. So, what you mean is that if you allow to be uh, um, far from merger in a way that you might want to quantify, mm -hmm. then you get a 10 to the 4 increase in the rate, or not 10 to the 4 increase in magnitude? Um, no, no. What, what I mean is that since this, I'm oh, sorry, let me retreat the mm -hmm. question. These non so compact binary are very far from merger, but their yes. duration is very long, it could be years or more. Yeah, but uh, you observe that for one year. I mean, is that you cannot, uh, this uh, is this slope assume that you are observing there for the world all the time you sure. want. At some point, uh, this saturates to, to one year because, you know, I mean, the experiment lasts one year, two years, five years. And when you do put the 10 to minus 18, I put this number there. Okay, one year no, time. The, then how many of them can you see? It's the same number as the merger. Because there is one in spiral forever. Oh. I think this is just for galactic. Because I don't think you can see galactic in spirals at this, phase, at this stage. You don't have uh, enough, uh, enough strain. You can you, you cannot see galactic in spirals? The galactic in spirals, this, uh, this rate is in the universe, and this, uh, it's, uh, I think it's in the galaxy. Lisa will see galactic in spiral binary, but not far away. So there is not enough power to go too far. I mean, the distance kills them. Okay. okay. And then there are uh, ob in, uh, in spirals and merger involving uh, large black holes. In the center of the galaxies, there are the black holes. We can have mass between a million and a billion solar masses. And there are many class of signals involved with these objects. Uh, the typical uh, one case which is interesting for the least frequency band is the star, a small, small star, which is orbits uh, very close to a giant black hole. And in this case, uh, you have this kind of signal. They are called the stream mass ratio because, uh, yeah, because it's a small star with a giant black hole. I, I read somewhere that the detection rate expected here is uh, more or less uh, yeah, 100 detection per year. And then there are also, the, to, to conclude, the binary spirals of two giant black holes. Okay? That is a very, imagine, slow process. The frequencies involved are very small. They are the frequencies of interest at uh, pulsar timing arrays. Although, this is, it concerns the, the upper end of the, mass, of the mass range. If you are in the lower end, you can still observe the supermassive black hole spiral in LISA. And these are the, the ones you can see. You, you, in this you can see either supermassive black hole in spiral, because, so in other galaxies, of course, because the masses involved are large, or if you are want to, 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 to stay on stellar size objects, uh, you are confining the galaxy. And now you have a couple of pictures. So this one is. Uh, in blue, the sensitivity of LIGO, more or less, in the frequency strain plane, as we already have decided then. In green is uh, ET sensitivity. You see, as uh, Ricardo was mentioning last time, it is not only lower, but goes to, in theory, it's supposed to work at the lower frequencies. And the red signal is, you see, exactly the same shape that I, I draw here, is the signal for the coalescing into a star, into a star. So already visible, in LIGO, but even more so in ET. The interesting thing is, uh, which is happening in ET, you see this time, this time marks here, this is telling you how much time the object is, is, is spending in the given frequency, okay? So you spend 20 hours from coalescence, it is uh, uh, rotating at uh, 2 Earths, then it takes uh, 14 hours to go from 2 Earths to 3 Earths, 
and then the thing accelerates, okay? And the time it is to uh, 100 Earths so or 20 Earths, uh, it is in the last six minutes of its life and it goes very, sweet, very, very quick, okay? And here you see the, 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 the process is so slow, it takes more or less one day, that uh, the amplitude uh, is uh, modulated, as in the violet uh, curve, uh, by the rotation of the Earth. Ah, the, the, the detector is on the Earth, rotate, the Earth rotates, so the inclination of the star with respect to us change, and so you can observe uh, in ET this modulation. There is a modulation in amplitude, and there is also a modulation in frequencies which I haven't drawn here, which is relevant either for the spiral and also for the periodic signals, like uh, rotating neutral stars. If you have a periodic signal and you observe it for one year in your detector on Earth, you're not going to observe a periodic signal. You're going to observe Doppler shifts due to the rotation of the Earth and another modulation due to the rotation of the, of the Earth around, the revolution of the Earth around the, solar, the, the Sun. So there are these two modulations, which are also very big. They complicate a bit the detection strategies because you don't have to look in the, in the line in the Fourier space, but it also makes it uh, very helpful to localize the object. The reason is that gravitational waves, as I argued before, emit more or less around all the sky. There is some modulation, but it's not very big, so it is detectable in every direction, like sound. That's why they're called silence, okay? Instead of light, which is beams. And uh, so, this is good, we can detect more, but this is bad because if we detect something, we don't know where it comes from, only roughly. With these periodic signals, in spirals or really periodic signals, the Doppler modulation is different uh, according to the direction of the sky where the signal comes from. And so, it is a great help to determine the direction of the object. And so you can tell to the astron to, to astronomers where the, where the object comes from. Another plot, which you can see, is uh, this is uh, specific for LISA, a list of sources which are interesting for, uh, for LISA. You see the massive black holes of 10 million solar mass. According to the mass, uh, they sweep uh, this, uh, this kind of signal in the, in the LISA frequency band. And there are also uh, galactic, uh, or maybe extra galactic as well. Yeah, it's also extra galactic, you're right. These are extra galactic binaries, like everyone seen in LIGO, but taken at the very beginning, I mean, at some earlier stage of their, uh, of their, uh, of their evolution. So you, in this moment you see the spiral, it will take, us, I don't know, a year to move from here to here. And then it will take another five years to move from here to this region where there is LIGO and ET. So there is a possibility that uh, Lisa will see something and will tell uh, to the other people in ET, look, in five years you will see two black holes with this mass emitting this object. So you can see the same object in two, in two different instruments. Then there are the galactic binaries, the objects which I was talking about. Galactic binaries in the early phase of a spiral, which is always a uh, purple zone. And uh, these uh, stars are the so-called verification binaries, so binaries which we know they are there. The violet are just simulations. The, the stars, the, the rest of the blue stars are binaries that we have seen nearby. And we, we know what we will meet, and so when Lisa will be switched on, they will have to, to see them, and it is also useful for calibration. Then there is the MRIS. The MRIS is basically when uh, the, the small star is orbited, orbiting a, a big black hole, and MRIS, and typically the orbit in this case is very elliptic, and uh, it, uh, being elliptic, it uh, excites several harmonics of the gravitational wave signal, not only the quadrupole, but the octopole one as well, and this line corresponds to the various harmonic. And to conclude, there is uh, a background, a stochastic background, which is uh, formed by galactic binaries, which are individually too faint to be detected, so they are not 
maybe as close uh, to each other or uh, as massive as this uh, violet one. So you cannot detect them because there is not enough SNR individually, but uh, put together they will form a background, a resolve background, which we discussed last time, and which is also uh, uh, we limit the sensitivity of LISA in this point. LISA in principle could see up to here, but there will be this background uh, with an estimate of galactic binaries which will appear uh, like noise in the detector. Okay, so and now uh, let me have some. Okay, this is uh, more comprehensive. <laughs> I have another time to find uh, good pictures for including uh, the whole uh, uh, frequency range. Some of them are old, some of them are not good. So this one I found it, I don't remember even where, but uh, just forget this uh, square. This square was from the paper studying some effect, which I don't remember what it is. This is a, a nice summary of, uh, of uh, the theta balls. You see this is a uh, LIGO, compact binaries, supernova pulsar, well, as we discussed. Then we move to LISA, and you have uh, the galactic binaries, the stream mass ratio, the background of the binaries and the big black holes. Not so big, one million mass black holes. And when you go still down in frequency, there are the, consider just this one, the basically the, the pulsar timing arrays, which have detected a signal, as you mentioned. This signal is supposed to be either a stochastic background of whatever origin, cosmological or astrophysical, or some individual uh, billion billion mass of binaries, okay? And so now I think I have some time yeah, to discuss the background of cosmological origin, which is a bit more exotic subject. The generation is completely different and the propagation, you have to be in a cosmological setting, here you have the metric uh, for the three monobers of open space. I use conformal time, which is this special time, you just can take the A before it, I hope it doesn't uh, disturb you. And the gravitational wave is described as usual as a TT part of the space-time of this object. Okay? And you can just do your propagation equation, now you are in good space-time, but you have to take it apart of the expansion of the universe. And by using a suitable variable, you can write the equation in this way, in Fourier space, uh, space, Fourier space, and still using conformal time. And we seem to do the role of uh, the energy momentum test. So it's an appropriate uh, component of energy momentum test, so to stay on the right hand side. And you look at this equation, and you see that, uh, first of all, this object uh, is typically, since A is a power law, if this object is more or less one over, uh, one over eight squared. Okay? A prime prime over A is one over eta squared times time coefficient. So you have two regimes. If a wave mode is much smaller with respect to one over eta, the mode is constant, H is constant. And if uh, uh, the, the, length, the wavelength is uh, smaller, is larger, so high frequency, this mode is decaying. Okay? This is supposed to relate to, be to the per perturbation, which is typical behavior of every cosmological perturbation, scalar or tensor. When you say it enters or exits the horizon, I think you, you heard about that. And so typically what happens is that in, in inflationary period, the horizon is flat, then you start a different dominance, and this is basically the, your plant, with uh, some point exit the horizon, it's frozen, why well, everything decays when like one over a, when like over a, so it is amplified with respect to the rest, and then it re-enters and, uh, and it decays. Okay, so the, the more it stays out, the more it is amplified. And you can just compute, uh, you start from a given level of perturbation generated during inflation, which is also a subject uh, I will not get into, but it is a Ampli classical amplification of quantum fluctuation, it is a, a very well known phenomenon. It has a flat spectrum, and then you are, uh, each wavelength of this uh, generated here undergoes a different destiny according to the wavelength. The shorter wavelength will never or barely exit the horizon, will not be amplified, the larger wavelength will be amplified. In the end, you end up with uh, a typical fall. Fluctuation produced uh, during inflation and amplified uh, in the subsequent cosmological evolution, you end up with uh, 
and energy density of the in gravitational waves of 10 to minus 16. I didn't choose the number uh, by chance. It is the limit of what we have on the cosmological microwave background, 10 to minus 16, times a unknown theoretical incertitude, which is basically the power of this fluctuation, the ratio of the power in this fluctuation between the tensor and the scalar modes. The scalar modes are more or less measured in the CMB, the tensor, we don't know. So if the ratio is 0.1, you are at a limit, 10 to minus 16. So since uh, CMB, we have measured, uh, not measured anything uh, with the sensitivity of 10 to minus 16, it means that this ratio is at most 0.1, i.e. very smaller. This is uh, for frequencies which are larger than the C frequency at the equivalence time. So it is the frequency, the frequency when, when uh, uh, radiation and metal domination change epochs, which uh, the shift now is 10 to minus 17 Hz, which is the frequency where the CMB observation more or less takes place. For smaller frequency, uh, since uh, the behavior in uh, MD and MD in the horizon is different, you have an extra factor and you get one over first square. Okay? And so, basically, the, 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 the omega in frequency is like that. The omega of gravitational wave perturbation produced with inflation, and this is uh, 10 to minus 17 Hz. Okay? And this is, uh, this is where uh, the CMB observation is. So I put uh, the, the, the uh, largest possible background with which we could have. Of course, it could be, it could be much lower. Okay? This is the upper bound. And now you see the problem of this uh, spectrum is that it is flat. And if you plot uh, all the sensitivity of the other objects in this, uh, in this uh, space, uh, omega GV, GW, during the correction, right? Since the omega GW is uh, F cube times uh, HS squared, mm? no, sorry, the Q times S, SN, it, uh, all the bounds are larger, okay? This is uh, the, the, the pulsars, and there is Lisa, and then there is uh, uh, ET, okay? So this is 10 to minus 16. Here you are 10, uh, 10 to minus 12. You can just take the number we used last time, you multiply by F cube over H square squared, and you obtain this number. And this is 10 to minus 6 in omega. And you see, you have a flat spectrum, that's a problem. Because you have a flat spectrum, you have a small bound, a low frequency, and that is key. Of course, people now can think to uh, more or less uh, other way to generate a cosmological spectrum, which is blue. So you want something blue. Do we have a blue one? Yes. Yeah, you can explain why the F cube to uh, move from omega to huh? Why you move from SN to omega with an F cube? I did that the last time, I think. Ah, okay. No? Because. Uh, you basically move from the Fourier transform to the energy density, you gain two factors of, uh, of the frequency. And the other factor is uh, the, the, from the strain to the Fourier transform. And okay, now speaking about possible blue spectra, there are other phenomena which can produce uh, cosmological perturbation. One possible, I mean, I might to, to speak about something happening before the CMB for a moment. If it is happened afterwards, you don't have a bound. One possibility is a first order phase transition. That happens when you have, uh, sorry, I'm using a lot of both not today, but yes. When you have a potential, you know, like that, uh, no, like this, which evolves and becomes something like this, and then something like this. Okay, this minimum was, uh, this was a true minimum, and at some point uh, this becomes a true minimum, and the pass of this to this in a first order phase transition is uh, sudden. Okay, it's not continuous. A second order phase transition is, uh, is something similar, but uh, it happens like that. In this case, the passage from the two minima is smooth. There is never a barrier. Okay, 
In the first order pre-transition, you basically create, at some point, uh, bubbles of true vacuum, and these bubbles expand, and they collide, and they generate a lot of gravitational waves. Uh, unfortunately, the two phase transition which now happen in the universe, the electric phase transition and the phase transition are not first order. So that kills it. Of course, you can imagine other first order phase transition happening, you know, at God's case, beyond some of other stuff, uh, that they will give uh, spectra which are could still satisfy this bound and which could be blue and arrive uh, here or here. Possibly. Another also speculative uh, background is given by cosmic strings. Cosmic string uh, arises when you have uh, a potential which has an, a new one uh, symmetry. Yeah, like this one, but a uh, rotation. Okay. So you have a uh, wolf possible uh, minima and it may happen that the field has a, a structural minima which in goes with the full circle in, in, uh, in space and so at some point uh, when you are in the middle you don't know where to go and you are forced to stay here and that creates a string which is a sum given energy density given by this mu which is the tension of a string which is related to the theory which is below to the kind of potential etc and also this uh, can have a blue spectrum is completely unconstrained because it could happen even after the CMB, and that also in principle could give you something. So, to summarize, there are some sources which are reasonably sure for future detections, some other sources which are uh, more speculative, um, but still, you know, mm, you're opening a new uh, channel of observation in so many other magnitude uh, and. Uh, Unexpected things could come up, okay? So, <coughs> basically, this is over. I will, I just have another figure, which is totally incomplete, but it doesn't have a, the CMB, for instance. But this is just, uh, it's nice because it shows this is the strain and this is the, the omega. How, how the two things are played. Just to give you more or less. And I think I will stop here. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Of course. If you know more, uh, yes, 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 yes. No, no, uh, I mean, even uh, granular unification scale transition yeah. could be first order, but this is the, the least uh, exotic. Mm -hmm. There are much more exotic things that you can imagine. In a strain? strain? Yeah, more or less. Yeah. Okay. Which, is Which is cool because uh, you can see the same signal in both because it goes down. If it was the other way around, uh, no, no way. Yeah? F to the minus 760 is basically minus 1. And house Taylor is uh, somewhere here, not in the laser. House Taylor, the period is eight hour, you just compute the frequency and it's in another uh, class. It is too far apart. When I'm speaking about binaries in spiral in laser, I'm speaking things which are closer because the period must be a hundred seconds. Not the minutes, well, not a few seconds here, but at least a hundred seconds. Or a thousand seconds, one hour. 
the period, not with time to coalescence. One hour means we will coalesce in a hundred years. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, the, I don't think we can see pulsars in Dewey, I don't know. I mean, they, they are active relative nuclei, which are the big, uh, but they are not good clocks at all. They are not pulses, they are just continuous thing. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't even know if we can see pulsars in other galaxies. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I guess so, but uh, you know, we know uh, 300 millisecond pulsars in our galaxies, so that tells me that probably we don't see any outside. There is also a problem with the beam because uh, the beam has a certain width, and we're just lucky in the galaxy that you know that uh, the beam is pooping for us. And if you are a thousand uh, times further away, the beam is, is nowhere. Yeah. Yeah, the sun is not one hundred thousand and larger. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, sorry. Okay. So when we come back in two thousand forty. We will see. We will see what happens. But we come back before. Yeah, next year. No? Next year, yes. Next year, the interesting is gravity in December. So, but it be too early. Mm -hmm. it's not so but yeah, by then we will all. Yeah, we are supernova in the meantime of a rotating new star. So there was there was a supernova earlier this year, but um, it was not galactic. It was. Uh, a galaxy of the Virgo cluster. You know, the Virgo cluster is our cluster, the cluster closer to us. So it was some 10 megaparsec away. That's, that's, that killed the possibility to detect it with the second generation detector. And also with third generation detector. Is this here in our galaxy up to That's the Milky Way, because uh, there is something like true, that. True, true. But uh, so in the Vigo cluster, there must be, I don't know, how many? I mean, thousands of galaxies. Yeah.